All right, welcome to class. Good to be with you. This is Monday, July 20th. We are starting a new chapter, chapter 23, part one here. Homework uh, eight for this chapter will be due Tuesday. We're going to cover this chapter in one day. Just the two uh, class periods. Test two is due tonight. It will be available on Learning Suite. Uh, just like before, it's over chapters 19 through 22, not 23. <laughs> 23 is going on here. So 22 is the last one, the carboxylic acid derivatives. Um, and also there's a quiz, quiz six, which will be due Tuesday. So yeah, you have the, the day there and you can meet with recitation leaders and get, get help with that. But quiz six uh, will be due Tuesday. And then also chapter 24, moving on on Wednesday. So don't get behind on the reading and keeping up uh, on the material and watching the videos. Very important to stay stay up to uh, up to speed here on the topic. Sorry, it moves so quick there. Uh, we feel for you. <laughs> um, but you can do it. It's just a matter of spending enough time, I think. Uh, to help you out with uh, test uh, two here, we've got a little review of a bunch of the reactions, mainly from chapter 22, I think, because there are a lot of those reactions in there, the carboxylic acid derivatives. Eight problems. If you want to pause your video and work those, that's fine. And now we're back. Let's see if you got the right answers here. Uh, benzonitrile with the ethyl Grignard. We'll go to the ethyl uh, ketone there, okay, after quenching with water. Let's see, sodium methoxide, uh, we'll do a transesterification there with this cyclic uh, lactone, remember? These cyclic esters are called lactones, unfortunately, I think. It sounds like it's a ketone. It's not. It's an ester. Transesterification, uh, we did that reaction. If you want to keep track of the mechanism there, you're in methanol, so you convert that and then protonate there. Let's see, the, we've got the cyclic anhydride. So yeah, a lot of times, you know, you want to use the mechanism to keep track of things. One of the carboxylates on the anhydride is the leaving group. The other is the electrophile. Okay, they're not both an electrophile. So what do you get here? You get the amide and you get the free carboxylic acid down here. So you break the bond there, carboxylic acid and amide there. Let's see here for this one, you've got the, uh, again, an ester, and the more stable derivatives is, again, the, uh, the methyl uh, amide in that case. Back to cyanide here with LAH, that's going to go to what? A primary amine. And make sure you count that carbon, one, two, three, four, five carbons, yeah, after quenching, you get that. Let's see, sodium hydroxide with an amide. Forcing conditions, heat here. Yeah, there you can go back to carboxylic acid. Ah, but it goes back to the sodium salt, carboxylic acid. What does the nitrogen end up as? Ammonia, okay, the neutral ammonia, because you're at what? High pH. So make sure you adjust the uh, structure there. Ester here, saponification reaction with hydroxide. We've got the stereo center there, which is retained, which becomes this alcohol. And then we've got sodium uh, acetate as our byproduct here, the acetate coming off. Oh, and then we got a multi-step synthesis one here. Let's see. You got four steps, I think. Uh, and we start with, what's this? Oh, ethane. <laughs> so simple starting material, chlorinate, radical conditions at room temperature, monochlorinate. So it'd form ethyl chloride. And then the sodium cyanide will form the... Uh, the cyano compound, that's SN2 chemistry. So yeah, these are both, what, 351 reactions. <laughs> and sometimes we need to use those. And then Dibol, uh, one equivalent there, and then quenching with water will give us the aldehyde. And then aldehyde with what, an amine? And this is what type of amine? A secondary amine? So what type of product do we expect to get here? Ah, the uh, enamine, right? So the uh, secondary amine, and then the alkene will be on the side there. Okay, so hopefully that was a good little review for you uh, to help you out studying here uh, for test two. 
or the final. Remember, final's cumulative, so we'll keep track of that material. Let's go to the outline here for chapter 23, see what we're up against. Let's get the view here, full screen. Okay, so <clears throat> enols and enolates. We've mentioned both of these before, and this is going to be a shift in our reactivity now. So far, we've looked at carbonyls as electrophiles undergoing nucleophilic attack. Now we're going to convert the carbonyl into a nucleophile, either an enol here or an enolate first, the treatment with base, or allowing for the enol to form under neutral or acidic conditions. These are generally reversible conditions here. And with hydroxide, this is a reversible reaction also. We're going to see some other types of bases here, LDA, lithium diisopropyl amide, and sodium hydride, sodium amide. Those are much stronger bases, which will form enolates under uh, irreversible conditions. Now, the reactions are going to be, well, the first one's a pretty standard one, uh, which will be halogenation. We've seen those electrophiles before, chlorine or bromine uh, or iodine. We won't use fluorine. Fluorine's just too reactive. But that's going to allow us to make the alpha halo carbonyl product. Okay, we'll look at the mechanism a little bit. We'll show you why that's important. We'll mention the halo form reaction and overhalogenation if you use base here. Uh, so this kind of highlights the two intermediates, enols or enolates. Uh, that's why we'll be covering that, but it is a very useful reaction. The more important reaction, I think, is enolate alkylation, which forms a carbon-carbon bond. The enolate here you see is charged. That's our nucleophile. And then we have alkyl halides, and these have to be sp3 hybridized. They have to be alkyl. Uh, they can't be aromatic or alkenal, sp2. Why? Because this is an SN2 type reaction. So the leaving groups here, here's our electrophile, here's our nucleophile. This is just like we saw in 351, except now we're preforming this strong enolate with an irreversible strong base from a carbonyl. I'll show you an asymmetric version of that, the Evans asymmetric auxiliary, and maybe an application of it, cyclosporin, the immunosuppressant drug. <laughs> and we're just showing you that application to highlight the principle of the reaction. We don't expect you to know everything about those applications. Then we got two other new reactions here, the malonic ester synthesis, which are the dicarbonyl compounds. This is from malonic acid. This is the diester. Remember those dicarboxylic acids? Oh, my, such a good apple pie. Well, here's the my part. The M has uh, three carbons, and uh, these methylene uh, hydrogens right in the middle can be easily removed uh, now, irreversibly, due to the pKa, if you've got two carbonyls here, the resonance stabilization makes this uh, deprotonation irreversible. The alkylation that occurs very reliably. And then the nice thing is we can hydrolyze these esters to carboxylic acids, and then one of them can be removed in a process called decarboxylation right there. So I guess there's another new reaction. Loss of CO2 or decarboxylation will give us the uh, carboxylic acid with the R group for alkylation purposes uh, attached at this alpha position. So we'll need to look at that mechanism too. Um, decarboxylation, yeah, here's the diacid after hydrolysis, then heating it up, losing CO2. Yeah, so that's kind of a key part of both of these, the malonic ester synthesis and the acetoacetic ester synthesis. So this is a ketone ester, but they're also beta to each other. So we can irreversibly form the enolate, alkylate cleanly, then hydrolyze. And this is the only spot where we can lose CO2. We're not losing it over here because this is a ketone now. Okay, And so we can decarboxylate after we hydrolyze to give the product. And this is, you know, we have to raise the temperature. I say 80 degrees or 100 degrees. Let's differentiate that because you can stop at the acid after hydrolysis if you keep it at room temperature. But if you warm it up from these beta carbonyl carboxylic acids, you can easily lose uh, CO2. So that's kind of the key thing there. All right, let's uh, go back over to the board here. And I like to start out with a synthetic application right away. <laughs> so here you go. 
here's the molecule of the day, you could say Demerol. You've probably heard of that drug before. Demerol does what? It's used to treat pain. In fact, acute serious pain, it's often used. It's not recommended to be used for chronic pain. Or a repeated use can often develop tolerance and dependence. So it's also an opioid type drug. In fact, it was designed based on morphine. In fact, you see some of the functionality that morphine has, a tertiary amine, some oxygenation in the form of this ethyl ester, and then this benzene ring. And then you see the six-membered ring, the papyridine ring here. Um, so it's, it's very potent. It's almost as potent as morphine in binding to the opioid receptor. Problem is chronic use will lead to dependence and tolerance. Uh, you'll become addicted to the drug, which is, of course, a very bad side effect. Um, how is it made? So this is why we're talking about it here. Well, we've got an ester and a benzene ring here. And so these two bonds become strategic. <laughs> And what I mean is we're going to learn about reactions, how to put that in place. We're going to make it from this ester. Okay, So here's an ethyl ester, and these two methylene hydrogens here with base can be easily removed. Okay, In fact, the base that's used in the commercial synthesis is just sodium ethoxide. Okay? And when sodium ethoxide reacts here, it will form the enolate. Okay. In fact, we can do it twice. We need to form two of these bonds here. So what electrophile do we need? Well, it's this dichloride, which is kind of a cool-looking molecule. Uh, it's got two chlorines on it, two ethyl groups, and then the methyl over here. So you can see the alkylation can occur here once, and then it can actually occur again. Okay, I'm not going through the whole mechanism, but this six-membered ring is formed with two alkylation reactions we need to talk about. And then you can think about you know, how this is made here. Maybe we can show that. Uh, this is made from the carboxylic acid, and we know how to do that. That's just a Fischer esterification with ethanol and acid, right? And then how do we make that carboxylic acid over there? <laughs> well, it's actually made from this alcohol, and that's a primary alcohol, and what's that? That's a chromic acid oxidation, right? <laughs> okay. And how do they make this alcohol, this primary alcohol? Yeah, they make that from the uh, Grignard reagent, the phenyl magnesium bromide. And what electrophile? Oh, you need two carbons here? Well, it's just ethylene oxide, and then clench with water. So I kind of show you the whole synthesis of Demerol. It's re relatively straightforward. Uh, the drug's been known a long time. It's still approved by the FDA for uh, clinical use. Uh, it's not an over-the-counter drug. <laughs> okay, it's uh, just prescription only. But uh, the reactions you've seen here, and the key one being this, that we need to talk about. So what is this key idea for how we're changing the reactivity now in Chapter 23? So the idea is we've got a new approach to carbonyl. So far, we've looked at this, right? Different nucleophiles adding to our carbonyl, tetrahedral intermediate, and then all sorts of stuff going on, right? So that's chapters 20 through 22. Okay, we've been looking at that. But let's do something different now. Instead of adding a nucleophile first, let's add a base, okay? And this base has to have appropriate properties. Um, it's better if it's a weaker nucleophile, and it's better if it's a strong base, because we're going to pull that proton right there. And let's just leave the electrons behind right on that position. So when the base grabs the proton, we leave behind what? We form the anion here. Now this is resonance stabilized, right? And we're going to call that what? An enolate. Okay. That's kind of the key thing because now we've treated it first with a strong base and it's no longer electrophilic to undergo nucleophilic attack. This is now the new nucleophile, okay? And it's a very good one. It's resonance stabilized here and we can react it with different electrophiles like alkyl halides. And these, like I said, have to be sp3 hybridized and primary and secondary. Uh, tertiary will do eliminations. So this is just like what reaction we learned before, right? SN2, okay, from 351. But we're forming an enolate a different way. 
So bring the electrons down, attack here. Here's our leaving group, the halide. And what do we get? We get the alpha alkylated product there. So alkylation, this will be the key thing uh, for the enolates. We'll look at it first. Uh, we'll also do enols, uh, which is a little bit different thing here. Okay, so we got enolates with strong base, and these are usually the charged ones. But we can also form a nucleophilic intermediate from carbonyls under neutral conditions. <laughs> in fact, even if we just put this in water, okay, uh, acid will make it go a little faster. We can also form enols, enolates, but but yeah, that that, that will form the enolate, uh, you know, with the with the stronger base hydroxide. But if it's just acid in water, what will form here? is the enol, okay? Now the enol is neutral compared to the enolate. Uh, it's an alkene alcohol, hence the name there, but it's still nucleophilic, right? So how can it react with electrophiles? Well, like this, bring the electrons down and attack there, and that will give you the protonated carbonyl with the electrophile stuck on the end. Now that will be the basis for halogenation that we'll look at. Um, so those can be quite efficient with a strong enough electrophile like a halide. So this is the basics of uh, the whole thing. And in fact, also moving into chapter 24, we'll look at other electrophiles there, like aldehydes and ketones, the aldol reaction. So <laughs> this new paradigm, this new approach to converting the carbonyl into a nucleophile holds for these next couple chapters here. Okay, let's look at this enol right here first. Just kind of an unusual looking thing. We've looked at carbonyls before in water, right? We looked at what? The hydrate formation. <laughs> we already did this. So why are we talking about enols now in water or a little bit of acid? Uh, well, this is kind of the rest of the story. Remember, we said this is reversible. And this could be a very low percent, okay? So we're kind of giving you the rest of the story. This isn't the only thing that could go on. Remember we said you can't isolate the hydrate. Another thing that goes on here is formation of the enol, okay? And this enol is generally a very low percentage also. Let's look at a couple of these. So if this is from acetone, this enol is about 1%. If we have cyclohexanone and put that in water, we can form the enol of that also. But again, it's very low percent. It's less than 1%. Okay. So yeah, these reversibility arrows need to be there. But once these guys form, even though this is a small percentage, these can also function as nucleophiles, right? Even though the equilibrium is not favored. These are actually very electron-rich alkenes, so they can react with electrophiles, okay? Let's look at some percentages here, though. So 1%, 1%. Let's see, though, if we've got a change in the structure, let's look at these two ketones, for example, and think about their enol formation, okay? What can occur here? Well... <laughs> The enol of this dicarbonyl would look like this. What do you think the percentage of that enol is from this beta dicarbonyl, diketone here? The percentage here at equilibrium is 76%. <laughs> enol, why? <laughs> we need to pause at that point. Okay, yeah, somebody has an idea. Look, the enol alkene is in resonance with the carbonyl. So you get that extra three to five uh, kcals per mole resonance stabilization energy. And plus, we can draw this right here as an intramolecular, what, hydrogen bond. <laughs> so that helps it out 76% of the time. We can draw it like that, but a lot of the time, even in neutral water, it's sitting as the uh, enol form. Why? Because it's got the resonance conjugation. What about this ketone right here? Uh, I have to give you the bottom line on this ketone. This is an imaginary ketone. It's never been made. <laughs> Why? Does it look unstable? What's wrong with that ketone? 
Well, consider the enol form of that ketone. What is this? Right, this is not cyclohexadienone. <laughs> this is phenol. And what's the percentage of this enol? You can look at this part right here and say, okay, that's an enol, right? This would be the keto version over here. But what's the percentage here? 100%, okay? Why? Then you have the 30 to 40 kcals per mole. What? Aromatic resonance stabilization, where this one does not, okay? Now, this process of taking the proton up here and moving the proton over here, there's a process for this. These are isomers of each other, a special type of isomers. What do we call them? Tautomers. And a tautomer is just where you move a hydrogen atom, okay? And so a lot of times it's favored on one structure or the other. You need to look at that and think about why that is. Why are the keto versions often the most stable form here? Well, you have carbon-oxygen pi bond resonance, which is more stable. Carbon-oxygen pi bond is more stable than a carbon-carbon pi bond, okay? It's also because the carbon-hydrogen bond is more stable than an oxygen-hydrogen bond. So there's a couple factors there. But resonance uh, can make it more favorable to be in the enol form, okay? Now, how do we get from one to the other? Let's show a little bit on mechanism. Uh, enols do form faster under acidic conditions. So let's look at this. What would be the mechanism for this? And pushing electrons here is meaningful, uh, just so you get used to it, and it'll be a, a model for a lot of other mechanisms. And in fact, we already know how to do this, right? So let's go ahead and protonate here. So that will give us the ketone that will be protonated. <clears throat> and then what? Well, we've got to take a proton off, right? So we've got the proton on what will become the enol hydroxyl. How do we get this one off? What base do we use? Well, we're in water. So we need to uh, move the protons around there. We don't want to use hydroxide. We don't want to form an anionic intermediate. We're under acid conditions. And this is a key I needed to mention before. If you're under acid conditions, all your mechanisms should show cationic intermediates. If all of a sudden you're showing an anion under acidic conditions, something's wrong about your mechanism, okay? We don't have enough hydroxide to pull it off. We're in water at lower pH. So our base here is actually water itself. And we've got cationic intermediate. So what's this intermediate look like? Well, this goes directly to the product, right? And plus we form some hydronium ion. Okay, we get back the, uh, the acid catalyst. Now, <clears throat> let's do the mechanism in base. <laughs> so what would this look like? Sodium hydroxide or hydroxide, so higher pH. How would we do the mechanism now? Oh, now we'd have negatively charged species. We can go directly to the enolate. Okay, and then use what? Use uh, water to uh, protonate it. And then you see our byproduct there is hydroxide, okay? So that's low pH, high pH. What about neutral pH? What about uh, if we don't have high concentration of acid or base? The enol can still form a neutral water, uh, but you should have an all neutral intermediate. In fact, it's a concerted mechanism. Um, it requires a little more organization. This bimolecular thing, they have to collide with the right geometry, so it's a lot slower than the acid or base thing. And what you can do here is what? Uh, grab that proton with water, push the electrons in here, and then grab that proton off of water. <laughs> and the motion of those uh, four arrows gives you what? Let's see. Yeah, the uh, enol and water back <laughs> under neutral conditions, right? So these mechanisms, I think, are good to review. We did this for hydrate formation. We did it under the different three different conditions. And here you see enol formation under that same, uh, same regime of different things. All right, let's look at different bases for how this can be done. So enolate formation and equilibrium. Let's use pKa's to figure out which base we're going to use here. So let's have sodium hydroxide as our typical cheap base. 
can we form the enolate? Yes, we just showed that. But numerically, let's keep track of this and see how favored this is, right? What do we need to know here? We need to know pKa's of the acids involved. Where's our acid on the left here? It's not that, it's this. We need to know the pKa of that, right? So what is that? pKa is 20, okay, quite high. That's a very weak acid, <laughs> much, much weaker than acetic acid, right? It's an inverse scale. The higher that number, the weaker the acid. That also means the higher that number, the stronger the conjugate base. So enolates are pretty strong <laughs> bases, okay? Where's our acid on the right here? Yeah, it's water. What's the pK of water? 15. So what's the K for this reaction right here? K for the equilibrium. And this is an estimate, right? And so that's equal to what? Uh, 10 to the power of the pKa on the right minus the one on the left. So this comes out to what? 15 minus 20. So this is 10 to the minus 5. So is this reaction favored? So which way do we draw the equilibrium here? Uh, we would not want to show it going to the right. This is reversible. In fact, it's highly favoring the other side. You're only forming the enolate at, what, 0.01%, very small amount, okay? That doesn't mean we can't use this reaction because if we have a very fast step here with a very good electrophile, we can still do this using this base that only forms a little bit of this. And we say these are what? Reversible conditions, okay? So a simple ketone or carbonyl compound with hydroxide will only form a small percentage of the enolate. And you can estimate it there. Let's look at some other bases. How about TB-toxide? You know that one from uh, before. TB-toxide will go to tert-butyl alcohol. What's the pKa there? Oh, 18. It's a, uh, a weaker acid, stronger base because of the bigger alkyl group here. And so what's the K for this reaction? Again, it would be 18 minus 20, so it's 10 to the minus 2. So it's still reversible here, and it's still not highly favoring, but that's a part per 100, okay? So there's a lot more of the enolate being formed under reversible conditions with TB toxide. Why? Because the pKa here is much higher for the alcohol. So hopefully you're getting a feel for that. Let's look at a couple others. How about sodium hydride? You remember that one? And what would be the conjugate acid for that? Yeah, it would be hydrogen gas, okay? So go ahead and deprotonate with hydride here. <laughs> okay, we can do that. <laughs> Form the same enolate, same pKa for the ketone. But what about the K, what about the pKa for the conjugate acid? Oh, it's 35, look at that. <laughs> so what's our K for this reaction now? What's 35 minus 20? Oh, this is 10 to the 15. So this one is highly favored now to the right, okay? And what do we say? This is not reversible now. This is now irreversible. This completely forms enolate. And the byproduct here being hydrogen gas bubbling out of the solution. That's another thing. Entropy is in your favor too <laughs> with this reaction. So highly favored. Very different base than these reversible alkoxy bases, right? Whereas here, you've got that. And now let's look at the, the main event guy. LDA has its own acronym, so it must be important, right? What is LDA? It's diisopropyl uh, lithium diisopropyl amide is the full name for that. So let's use that as a base here, and it will go to the amine. And what's the pKa of a neutral amine to lose that hydrogen here? Yeah, 38. <laughs> very, very strong base, similar to sodium hydride, okay. LDA, uh, what will be the K here? It will be 10 to the, uh, what, oh, 18. <laughs> Even more irreversible, more favored, well, it's essentially the same. It's, I mean, it's all enolate at that point, okay? Uh, a couple things to mention here. Sodium hydride is small, so we'll have some regioselectivity issues there. LDA is nice because it's very large. We say it's bulky. This is a very bad nucleophile, so it'll function just as a base. Having these disopropyl groups here has a function. 
It's to keep it from just adding as a nuclear file here. Instead, it just grabs the proton there, okay? Now, let's look at some uh, regioselectivity issues. <clears throat> if we've got an unsymmetric ketone, let's look at this. We've got a ketone that has a methyl group on the side. So at the alpha positions, they're different. We have two methylene hydrogens here, and we have a methine hydrogen here, okay? So let's look at this. If we take LDA, we can actually do it at very low temperature, minus 70 degrees. That's a dry ice uh, acetone cold bath, we say. You can do it at higher temperature too, but the lower the temperature will accentuate the selectivity. We've got this position here that we say is more hindered, and then this position over here, which hydrogens are easy to remove with the bulky base? Yeah, it'd be over here. So this enolate from this unsymmetric ketone is right here, okay? So the byproduct is the amine, that's fine. We got the enolate there, and it forms just the less substituted uh, enolate. And we call that a kinetic process. Why do we say kinetic? Well, at low temperature, it's happening fast, and it's the less substituted enolate. Okay, you'll see what I mean in a second. Let's use a different base. Let's use uh, sodium hydride. Now, that's a smaller, uh, irreversible base, also a very strong base, but it, because it's small here, this will allow you to form the more substitute enolate. Now look at that alkene of the enolate. That has one, two, three, four groups on it. So we call that the thermodynamic enolate, okay? Because it's more substituted. And what? We have this complementary selectivity. We call this regioselectivity, okay? So what, what do we mean by that? Which side of a functional group gets gets functionalized. It's kind of like Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov, which was an issue of regioselectivity of, of, uh, of alkene uh, uh, additions, right? Now we're talking about enolate formation, either on the less substituted side with the bulky big base, LDA, or the small thermodynamic base. You can also form this with sodium hydroxide, but again, that's highly reversible but sodium hydroxide is small enough to form the thermodynamic product, the more substituted one. So these bases let you do some different things. Both of these are irreversible, completely form the base going, the enolate going to the right. This one is what? Reversible, okay? You can still use it to do reactions. It's the cheaper base. Sometimes it's the one we end up using. LDA is more expensive. But LDA will give us this advantage of regioselectivity, the less substituted spot, okay? So we'll see some uh, reactivity differences. Another thing to point out here with enolates is stereochemistry. And this can become a very important issue <laughs> if you're not sure what you're doing to your chiral molecule. So here's a molecule it has a stereocenter at an alpha position to a ketone. Okay. Now, if you put that in water that has any base associated with it, you're going to have a problem. Okay. This can be observed. The alpha rotation here, this is the R uh, enantiomer. It has a rotation of plus 72 degrees in the polarimeter. But if you put it in water with base, guess what? That optical rotation within four hours goes to zero. <laughs> Why? You started out with the pure R that does have the optical rotation. You put it in base, water, and you can watch the optical rotation go down. Why? Okay, well, <laughs> what can occur here? Hydroxide, right? What's the intermediate look like? Well, it's an enolate. <clears throat> Which enolate is it? It's that one. So we need to point out something about what? Hybridization here. <laughs> and remember, what type of base is this? Ah, it's reversible, right? So this can go back to the ketone product, but what? Water 
will function as the electrophile, and it can attack on the top or the bottom, right? And that will give the two enantiomers. It will be racemic with the plus and the minus uh, enantiomers present 50-50 eventually. It takes about four hours. So the rate of this enolate formation and the reversibility parallels the rate of the racemization, we say, or the loss of optical activity. So you need to be careful about that. You'd want to keep that under neutral conditions and be very careful. There's another thing we can do here with D2O. In fact, if you just put this chiral ketone in deuterated heavy water, so this is the solvent, so it's 55 molar or whatever, <laughs> uh, the deuterium will eventually exchange out via the enol. So you can have enol being formed under the neutral conditions here, like we showed, right? The enol would be forming under this polar heavy water conditions. And then what? D can come in on the top or on the bottom, right, from heavy water. And that will eventually give you uh, deuterium at that spot. And you'll lose the optical activity again. <laughs> and look at this. You can also form the ene all over here on the methyl group because that's also an alpha position. And eventually, well, it takes uh, two days to get it all <laughs> to have, what, four deuteria around it <laughs> with, again, loss of the optical activity. So how come we don't get any deuterium on this methyl group right here? Yeah, because that's you can't form an enol up here. That's the beta position. We don't get any deuteria around the benzene ring. It's just at these alpha positions right here. Okay, so these heavy water uh, labels can be useful to keep track of mechanisms or point out you know the uh, pitfalls of some of these reactions. All right, let's get into the main event: the alkylation reactions. Um, I like to show those uh, up front. Some of the key reactions we're going to look at here. Let's take acetone with LDA and let's treat it with methyl bromide. So we're going to form the enolate. Okay. And we're going to react this then uh, because this is an alkyl. It's got to be sp3 primary or secondary. And yeah, certainly a methyl bromide is going to be a very good uh, electrophile. And we're going to get the uh, ethyl methyl ketone. Okay. You can also react this with more complicated electrophiles. How about allyl bromide instead on this enolate? Yeah, you're going to get this ketone. It's going to be very useful. It's going to have an alkene and a ketone in there. And that bond, keep in mind the strategic bonds right there, right? Allyl bromide brings in three carbons along with the alkene right there. You can also do this with esters. So you can have ethyl acetate with LDA, same thing, and also allyl bromide. And you can get the alkylation also at that alpha position on the ester. Okay. Remember, LDA is bulky. It's big, so it's not a nucleophile. We're not doing the derivative substitution here. We're just taking the proton off here, forming an enolate of an ester now, and then alkylating it there. Okay, you can also take it on a ketone here, and with the same steps, we can get the allylated ketone. And what if we want to do another alkylation here? There's a couple things we can do, right? Let's do more LDA and more allyl bromide. What will this give us? Well, our less substituting lights over here now. We're not going to form this one. So what's our product in this case? Yeah, it's this ketone where we've got the allyl over here and an allyl over there. Okay, it's that one right there. If we take this and treat it with sodium hydride now and allyl bromide, and a lot of times this is just the same pot, just another operation there within the same thing, treat with the base first and then and put it in there. Now, if we treat it with that, uh, what do we get? We get the ketone here with two allyl groups on it, and they're both at that spot. Okay. So why? This is a smaller reversible base, irreversible base. This is the larger one, so this will go over here. You'll get the two six product here. Okay. 
2,6-dialcyclohexanone. Here you get the 2,2 two, two product, right? Because what? The second alkylation occurs at the uh, more hindered spot with that one. Sorry, I can't move the board up. Hopefully you can see that okay. But yeah, that's the bottom line there on that. All right, let's do halogenation first. Uh, before we get into the details of alkylation, uh, <clears throat> halogenation is going to look like this. <clears throat> We're going to react our ketone or aldehyde uh, in the presence of halide, bromine, iodine, uh, chlorine. Can, it, can do it in water. Uh, with a little bit of acid catalyst, and usually this is acetic acid, and that's to help up the help the formation of the enol. The intermediate's going to look like that. We already talked about the mechanism of that formation, and then what? The halogen is our electrophile, so let's go ahead and bring the electrons down and do the attack. What's that going to give us? Going to give us the protonated form with the halide on there, bromide or chloride. And what, this is positively charged. So how do we get this off here? Well, with water. And so if we take the water off, we'll get the halogenated product, okay? So monohalogenation is done best under slightly acidic conditions with bromine or chlorine. You can do it with iodide, uh, but, but this type of product can occur there. So if you have cyclohexanone, uh, let's do chlorine water acetic acid. If you leave out the acetic acid, it'll still go, actually. It'll just be a little bit slower, okay? You'll get that product there. How about an aldehyde? How about cyclohexane carboxaldehyde? Same thing. Oh, let's do bromine. Water acetic acid. We'll get the alpha, what, brominated product. And yeah, so aldehydes or ketones work best. Uh, esters and amides aren't as good because enol formation isn't as good. It, it breaks the resonance with the uh, lone pairs there. Um, if you treat with excess material, so if you show excess here, chlorine, say EX, and have, you know, five or ten equivalents here, you can actually get the over uh, chlorinated product. So you can get trichloro. Uh, acetaldehyde in that case. All right. Um, yeah. Maybe that's all we need to say about halogenation. Um, yeah, enol formation. The slow step is the enol formation. Uh, the rate only depends on the concentration of the starting material. The rate is independent of the concentration of the halide because this is the fast step right here. So maybe that's all we need to show. We need to contrast this, though, with halogenation under uh, basic conditions. So if you do halogenation under basic conditions, you often get over halogenation. So here's chlorine uh, under sodium hydroxide conditions. So here we're forming the enolate, okay? And then the same thing with the chlorine electrons down. Here's our electrophile, and we get this. Now, we're under basic conditions. <laughs> the problem is, what? There's more protons here, and you have, what? An inductive withdrawing group. So under basic conditions, actually, hydroxide uh, likes this chlorinated uh, substrate better. <laughs> The pKa is actually lower in this case, and you can form this enolate. And now this enolate is more substituted, and it's resonance stabilized with the lone pairs <laughs> before I. So this this one uh, forms faster than the initial enolate actually. And so a lot of times you get over chlorination, even if you try to limit the amount of halide in this case. Okay. It's different than the acid conditions because once you have one halide on here, then protonating and then reforming the enol under acidic conditions is slower, okay? Because now it's harder to take that proton off, okay? 
But here, if you have this group already on there under basic conditions, the more substituting it can form, and you can get over halogenation. In fact, it's easy to get this. <laughs> uh, but that's not, you know, preparatively useful. We normally don't want it completely halogenated there. <laughs> so that's, that's something to avoid. Use the acidic conditions. That's the useful one. Let me show you an application real quick on this. So you can brominate the cyclic ketone under slightly acidic conditions. You get a very good yield, the alpha bromo product. And then you can treat with uh, lithium carbonate, a relatively weak base, a weaker base. Carbonate's pretty good. pK of carbonic acid's around five. Yeah. So sometimes you have to heat this up. But you can get the enol. Okay, so you can do what? An E2 elimination right there. Plus, this is a leaving group. So if you treat this with a benzylamine or any other good nucleophile, you can what? Get SN2 type reactions to occur. And you can get this type of product. So that benzylamine, an alpha amino uh, ketone, can be very useful there. So halogenation, first reaction. Uh, I think we'll take a break right there. We'll mention the haliform reaction a little bit, and then we'll do the uh, alkylation, both the malonic ester synthesis and the acetoacetate synthesis in the second hour. So very good. Let's take a break.